Hey, what's up everybody? It's Leeds, and we're back for some more Thronebreaker, and last time, well, perhaps we got a little complacent because we were taken on a Nilfgaardian encounter over here, and, uh, well, it did not go particularly well for us. We had, uh, two or three attempts at it, and we did a few good things and several bad things in that encounter. We may be able to still make it work if we just execute perfectly for that, However, I'm thinking that we have a few things that we may want to do in the meantime before we try this one again. I do have a plan if that is something that we're looking to do soon. However, however, there are still a lot of areas around here that we've yet to fully explore. I just want to double check since we did not succeed at taking out that encounter last time. Did it autosave after we did the stuffs here? Looks like it must have. I was afeard. Afeared the black clouds that catch wind of me. Hear me. Okay. So, the plan is that I don't think we're going to go straight back into this point of interest. Yes, we could potentially give it a shot. However, we do have a few things working against us here. One of which is that we are currently on low morale. So, it might make sense to instead focus on some of these other encounters here first. And get ourselves at least back to neutral morale. That'll give us a small advantage. The other thing is that, as we may have discussed in and around doing this point of interest, we could also certainly make some deck adjustments. Now, I have made it my mission to finish Edern without purchasing any new cards. I think it may still be possible to do that and still succeed at this challenge, but it's going to be a little bit difficult. There's one or two tricks up that I think we may still have up our sleeves there, making some other purchases that may not directly be units, but might give us a little bit more of a, an indirect advantage that we'll see as we take on some of these other things down here if maybe we get some other cards that might improve our chances of success here, but if not, I think we do still have a backup plan or two, so not too worried about it just yet. Of course, worse comes to worse, we can always stoop to the level of actually creating new cards, but that's, that's too easy. It's just too easy. There's no challenge in that. So, with that being said, let's carry on down here and we'll at least start collecting some resources. We actually have not a crazy amount right now, but a half-decent amount. We could potentially make some upgrades of some varieties. We did pick up this golden chest over here. That was hidden previously. There's a puzzle down here with some more loots next to it. I think there were several points of interest in this general area. It's been a long time since we had a puzzle, I feel like. We had one? What was it? Over here-ish? And then that feels like that was the only puzzle we had, really, in the entire latter half of Edern. So, maybe a little bit backloaded on the puzzles here. That'd be the other thing we could do here. This one, who knows? So, let's see. Also, just while we're in this me area here. Is there any loot to be had? Because, oh, the fact that it's saving the game does catch my attention. There's something important that's about to happen here. Maybe. I don't see any immediate sources of additional resources, so let's go for the puzzle. Let's try that on for size next. And I suppose we'll start with this one that is straight south. And we'll see what it's all about. What will it be? Corrupt weapons weapons be corrupt or is it just the people who use those weapons i don't know maybe we're about to find out elves used to say that dwan are imitators that they're only capable of mimicking other races there's a grain of truth in that and it's difficult to deny the innovative nature of humans after all they can turn anything absolutely anything into a weapon destroy all rock tossers and cow carcasses do not let any cow carcasses explode on your side. That is, um, yes, I am familiar with this card in Gwent multiplayer. Obviously, just about every card has been changed in sh some way, shape, or form for Thronebreaker, but the phrasing, <laughs> the phrasing is a little alarming. The exploding cow carcasses is not really a thought that I want to put in my brain right now, but it is a puzzle, of course, that means special rules and a custom deck, and it will be just one round, so let's get this started. Okay, what do we have on our hands here? We can't have any cow carcasses 
explode on our side. Whenever this unit takes damage, move to the other side of the battlefield. If this unit is on Meave's side, Meave loses the battle. So we can't destroy them when they're on our side. Are they going to... Okay, they've passed. So they aren't going to play in any additional cards. Every two turns on turn start, spawn a cow carcass on the opposite row. Meaning right here. So if we don't take this guy out quickly, then we're going to get even more cow carcasses. We need to damage these ones. Oh, actually... Those are all raw tossers. Yes, we need to take these guys out very quickly. Otherwise, they're going to keep on spawning cow carcasses on our side. It's real raw tossers and... Oh, and I was going to say, then why don't we just leave them here and never destroy them? Then we're fine. They don't, they don't trigger the death wish. We're good. No, we need to destroy them. In order to complete this puzzle, they just need to be destroyed on their side of the board. So, my first reaction before even looking at any of our cards is to say destroy these guys as quickly as possible and then poke our own cards with tiny little bits of damage in order to move them over but what are our options here stray slingers i remember these can target our own cards so that would be a way to move these guys over the fact that we have three stray slingers leads me to think that perhaps that means we're going to need to do that three separate times so, let's see. Let's take two turns for you to do this. The Wagenbergs will actually, I assume, gain armor whenever cow carcass gets spawned in their row, and in doing so, that will give them more damage. So I think... Hmm. Damage unit by two if it was destroyed, repeat this ability. We have had a challenge or two, a puzzle or two, with the Rivian Sappers previously, and generally, the idea was you need to chain this as many times as possible to get as many kills as possible. I mean, we certainly, I'm just thinking about it, if we had our leader ability, which we don't, then we'd of course be able to immediately destroy all these raw tossers, but bear in mind, they may only have three power, but the cow carcasses, they have eight and we will need to destroy them eventually. So, huh. Then again... Hmm. Okay, I mean, as is usually the case with all these puzzles, it's probably gonna be a bit of trial and error. I'm assuming this Rivian Sapper is probably the last card we play. We're working backwards from that. I'm assuming the Stray Slingers are gonna be the second, third, and fourth to last cards we play to damage our cow carcasses and move them over to the opposing side. And then, I guess that means Wagenberg's first? Unless it's two damage on the Slingers. Would it be double Slinger to take out all the Rot Tossers? And then save Wagenberg for our own cow carcasses? Then I feel like we're at serious risk of actually destroying them on our side, which obviously we don't want. Let's just start with what I feel like is the relatively obvious answer, and maybe correct, maybe incorrect. I feel like it's probably incorrect, but I think we go... We may let them? We may need to let them spawn more rot tossers on our side of the board. At least that's certainly going to happen if we go Wagenberg next. Yeah, if we had gone double Stray Slinger, to lead things off, we could destroy all the raw tossers before they spawn any more cow carcasses, and then it would just mean moving them over and still having enough damage to destroy them. But I think in order to get enough damage to destroy them, the Wagenberg may be necessary early. So if we do this, especially because that gives us a little more armor on this Wagenberg, and they have two raw tossers in their range row, so we're going to get two more raw tossers, or rather two more cow carcasses in this range row, so that is in theory, the preferred place for the Wagenberg. So let's see. Yep, that'll give us more armor and therefore more damage. So we could use this Wagenberg to destroy uh, this row, both of the raw tossers here. But I'm starting to wonder... Oh. I... Mm. One thing that I just noticed. So the Stray Slingers deal two damage every time they move a unit. Yes. That would drop all these raw tossers down to one power, which does bring them all in killing range for the Rivian Sapper, which means we could go... I 
think it's probably going to have to be. Slinger to move these guys. Rotoshers won't spawn any cows on our side next turn, which gives us enough time to destroy them all with the Rivian Sapper on our next turn. I'm just not sure we're going to have enough damage to destroy these cow carcasses, but I don't know. I don't know. We'll try it. We'll try it. And so the idea in that case would be to wait to use the Wagenbergs. They're going to be our primary source of damage. And here, no new cows, because they still need one more turn. So then we go Rivian Sapper. And I'd originally thought this was going to be our finisher. So I'm not 100 per I'm definitely not 100% confident in this right now, but you can't deny. That does at least seem pretty sweet. And so now, now the question becomes, which cows do we move? I think we move this cow, because then we have just three in the same row as the Wagenbergs, which means we can move all those on our next turn with the Stray Slingers, and we don't need to worry about a theoretical situation, which we might possibly need to use the Wagenberg, or use a Wagenberg on this row and actually take out the armor on the remaining Wagenberg. That'd be less than ideal, to say the least. So, let's move you. Okay. Now it's Slinger time. And we sling. move you. Okay. Then we go... End this turn. Another Slinger move you, and so we don't want to move any of these other cow carcasses that are on our opponent's side at the moment, otherwise we'll come back to our side and we're going to lose, by definition. So that means we're probably damaging ourselves, it shouldn't matter what we move, other than our Wagenbergs, we need all the armor we can get there, so... Okay, do the Wagenbergs have enough damage? I think they do, I think we might actually be good here. We go with that. And then use the other Wagenberg to do this. And there you have it. First try. Legitimately. Alright. Very nice. So, we are still on low morale after finishing a puzzle, but it does give us, I think, a little more resources. Certainly more resources after we do this looting. Occasionally, we get some other notable stuffs after finishing a puzzle as well. Not sure. Sure of them. Oh. Wasn't sure if I was noticing anything out of the ordinary until this guy showed up. What is your deal? Black lads were supposed to grind their teeth against our walls. Bloody empty promise by our leaders. Sounds like that did not go according to plan, uh, given how this village is currently on fire. Commander, onward to Evie. Bloody idiots. There a place for me in your ranks, your majesty. I'd so like to serve you. I do so with loyalty deserving of my own king. Oh, well, there you have it. Just one recruit, but it, hey, I mean, it's something. It is something. Not the same kind of commitment from that soldier, unfortunately. A little more resources over here. Oh, is that? I saw a quick question mark there. Hold on, let's take a quick look at our map. Yeah, some other kind of point of interest. Do we know about this one in advance? Or did this one only just pop up once we got here? I mean, either way, it's definitely worth taking a look. Interesting. I'm just curious if there's anything else hiding around here before we do that. No, that seems like it may be it. Other than this colorful, lily painted house over there? Not sure if we should read into that at all. I don't think we've seen that before. But anyways, what's the deal here? Report. Milady, we found a group of farmers languishing in the barn. Their skin is covered in oozing sores. Yikes. Some horrid affliction by the look of it. They beg for a coin to sate their hunger and thirst, as they've no strength left to work in the fields. Shan't refuse those in need, give them whatever's necessary, sacrifice a little bit of monies, and gain some morale. We do have low morale at the moment, so this could be a way to get us back to neutral. That being said, we have a couple of shrines that are still available to us, and so that might mean that if needed, we already have a way to increase our morale, and of course, it's 
not a huge price, but it's hard to come by the monies in Edern, so sacrificing 50 might be a bit of a downside, especially because that would, at least in the short term, drop us below 2,000, which may be a threshold for some upgrades. I don't know. haven't checked recently. Alternatively, they shall die of four long anyway, and our coin is needed elsewhere. We must ride on. That's pretty cruel. Or have Isabel tend to them. Perhaps she can devise a cure so they may join our ranks. To be honest, that's the first thing I thought of was, we have a healer in our group, and this seems like exactly what she signed up for. She said she does not want to take part in killing anyone, but healing is her thing, and so I have to imagine that this would not be an option if we had not already recruited Isabel, got her to be a part of the team, and so good thing that we did. Otherwise, she probably wouldn't have been here, but, I mean, also, six recruits is a pretty, pretty hefty sum, so I think we definitely take that. And hopefully, there are no strings attached there, hopefully, Isabel truthfully succeeded, and we're not going to get some kind of surprise a little bit later on, in which it says, oh, well, actually, Isabel was unsuccessful, and you thought that it worked, but it didn't, and now you lose half of your recruits because whatever their sickness was spread to the rest of your army. That would stink. That would stink. So, uh, really hoping that doesn't happen. Really hoping that doesn't happen. But let's just take another peek now at what else we might be looking at. There's another puzzle eastward. There is a point of interest that I think we caught out of the corner of our eye there as well. I'm kind of leaning toward possibly this puzzle, because this point of interest kind of naturally lends itself toward us going further across this bridge. It looked for a second there like it might have been blocked, in which case this bridge that we were planning to use to head back over to this point of interest that we had tried but not succeeded at a while back, we might need to go a different way toward that. I mean, then again, there's a fast travel spot here, so worse comes to worse, we just do that. No big deal. But I think, I think it just flows more naturally if we go to this puzzle next and... Let's see if there's anything in general in the easterly direction that might also be of interest. I think we kind of poked our head in over here. There does seem to be something down there. There's definitely lots of loot to be had. Is that where the point of interest is? Or is it here? Hold on a second. Oh, well, there's... There's another one. There's several... Over here, this is right before the ending. So I feel like we might not actually go into town here. I think we save those. We go for the puzzle. I think we go south toward the puzzle. Just picking up some loots. Don't mind us. Don't read into it. And that is the puzzle. Before doing so, I mean, generally we're going to have a custom deck in those anyway. So having the extra resources may not matter too much. Oh, that's travel spot. That's nice. Okay, I mean, it's not far at all from this one, so I'm not sure if it makes that big of a difference. Oh, also, there's a southern entrance into town there. But, okay, let's try on this puzzle for size. See if we can have the same kind of luck we had last time. That does not look good. Oh, dear. And again, there's more loot and another point of interest over here. Am I making this up? Wow, this is extremely dense in this area. Not sure if we should do that. I think we maybe do the puzzle first. It feels like just based on the positioning here that you're meant to do the puzzle and then check out this tent. So let's go for the puzzle. And it doesn't look good, though. It really doesn't look good. Pestilence. Rotting, unburied bodies invite not only flesh-hungry beasts, but also pestilence. From monstrous scavengers, one can flee or fight back. Yet what defense is there against an invisible enemy? When even air and water pose risk of a slow and painful death, remove all corpses from the board. Puzzle, special rules, just one round, custom deck, as we usually see with the puzzles, but what exactly is the catch here? Whoa, that is a lot of corpses. Death wish, damage adjacent allies by three. Ooh, that's very interesting. That's very interesting. Okay. <laughs> then we have... Oh, we do have a leader ability. Okay. So I was going to say, uh, we have no space with which to play our Lyrian Arbalist at the moment. So... Wow. This is... We have not seen a challenge like this before, but it is very, very different in a way that I feel like, you know, it's going to be fun. It's going to be fun to see what the answer is. 
Okay. Oh, wait, what? Who's it? Oh, it's not the same leader ability. Also, we rarely have leader ability uh, charges in the puzzles. Boost an ally by four, then give it one armor, then trigger all allies' loyal abilities. That's great for our Arbalists. It's not so great for our corpses. We do not want to be boosting those. We want to be taking them out. So the thing about the Arbalists... Oh, do we... Okay, so normally in... Wait, hold on. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Oh, okay, okay. So nine is the maximum number of cards in a row. So that means we should still have room to play Lyrian Arbalists here. So that's good, but certainly have enough damage to destroy one corpse per Arbalist. But obviously there's a whole lot more corpses than we have Arbalists. So I'm, my initial thought was you target the corpse in the middle, take it out, it damages adjacent corpses, and then you try to get as much of a chain reaction going as possible. We also have the Arbalist Loyal ability that damages a random enemy nearest to self by two, which means it's, I think we saw back when we had the Arbalist, it's going to damage a random enemy in this melee row. We don't know which one it's going to be, but that may or may not affect who we choose to target with the Arbalist going forward or very least might make it a little bit easier to chain the damage together so let's go arbalist first and i think we're going for one of these corpses in the middle i think we might go range row first and then we go long sword well actually hold on what is the cooldown for this one cooldown three i guess we still do this immediately i was wondering if you know is there a way to to fine tune it such that is it actually preferable if we wait a little bit until we have more Arbalists on the board, then we start going, but of course, then you're, you're not getting any damage immediately, and so you're probably getting fewer leaderability charges in total, and that presumably does not, does not make it as good as just going straight into the leaderability here. Which one doesn't hit? Oh, we technically would have preferred something in the middle, but now we end our turn. So here's the thing is we are at some point going to need to destroy the corpses on our own side of the board as well question is order of operations i was assuming we destroy one in in either maybe it was better to target melee row and just hope that the random damage from the leader ability does in fact make it so that you can Get an, an extra unexpected kill. Huh. We do need to destroy all of them in all rows, right? Yep. Okay, so I'm going to go with what my initial plan was. Which I'm not 100% sure is actually the way to go. But it was... Mm, it was either go for this one in the middle of the melee row or continue to chip away in the range row. So we're not going to get any random damage in the range row, at least not until we get rid of everything in this melee row. Which we are quite a ways away from doing. I don't know. I don't know. It's going to take a little bit of trial and error this time, I think. But, like I said, I'm intrigued. Also, we totally needed to take out the corpses in our own rows first, because now we don't have room to play these. I am a silly billy. I don't know why I thought I was going to be able to do these first. So we have, we've absolutely, uh, completely messed this one up. It is quite literally impossible for us. So, uh, well, now, now, this looks blatantly obvious that that was not the right way to go. For some reason, I initially thought that both sides, or every single row was completely full of corpses, and I was like, oh, we can't play a single Arbalist? This, how is this even possible? We did have enough room to play one in each row, but yeah, we definitely need to immediately target these, because otherwise we only have room to play one Arbalist per row, and then we are stuck as we currently find ourselves, so, okay. We'll take the mulligan on this one. I mean, my leader ability made a difference here? No, no, okay, so we certainly still can find a way to make this work. I think we just made a silly mistake there. I assume we want to play this on the end of the row so that it takes the longest before it gets damaged. Uh, does it matter? I think it matters which, which row we go for first, but do that 
technically, it does reduce the amount... Oh, well, I mean, I guess we have the same number of cards in this row as we had previously. But now, I, I guess we go boost you. And then, and this turn, and do we just keep on piling up on Arbalus in the same row? Hmm. We try to wipe them all out? I mean, as I was saying before, I think trying to get rid of this melee row first actually would be quite nice. Because then the loyal ability can start to hit their range row as well. It's like, what if we what if we play the Arbalist and damage you? That way you get you get down to just What is it? You get damaged by three, so you go down to just one. So then an errant a, a lucky leader ability that happens to hit you could take you out. Technically that's overkill damage, not sure that's gonna be much of a difference one extra damage but we do have enough Maria! enough time here that we can target you we don't need to take out a corpse immediately but I think now I mean now we do need to now we absolutely do need to but we can do that to just okay so here's the chain reaction that we're looking to perpetuate Okay. So, it is possible to deal a lot of damage quickly that way. It does. Oh. Oh. Okay. So, now the interesting thing. So, obviously, we'll end this turn. But the interesting thing is that after losing all those corpses on our side, we now have way less damage if we play anything in this range row. And it's currently the only place where we can play an Arbalist. Fortunately, we only need three damage to take out this corpse, it would not be enough to take anything else out. I do think we really want to get rid of this one. Might take a little bit of luck, but if we go Arbalist in this row, and we damage you, activate a leader ability charge, you have back now, we get four procs of random damage, which will hit their melee row, and we just would need to either hit you or you after we, well, no, how much? We need one on you or two on either of these guys. We might have made a Give little me. mistake here and might need a little bit of luck. Correct it. Okay, we did get that one down. That's key. So now we have almost a full chain. Almost, okay. Hopefully that one remaining corpse is not going to be a huge problem. But now we need to take out one of these corpses. Otherwise, we're going to... Well, I guess actually we... Mm, we don't have to immediately. Actually, we don't have enough damage to do that, to tell you the truth. So, huh. This one's tough now. This is where we, again, we might be just sort of experiencing the after effects of the mistake that we made previously. Where... We only have four damage, which means it's not enough to get rid of any of the corpses. Unless it's this one. This one, we're going to automatically get rid of next time we use a leader ability charge, so I'm a little bit reluctant to do that. With the little damage that we have, do we start to weaken a corpse on their range row, or do we weaken one on our side, not actually create any space on our side, at least not yet? That makes me a little bit reluctant. I feel like maybe we do. Go for you almost enough to take you out and then oh this is gonna get uh, 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 i don't know about this because now we have five damage with our next arbalist played in this row which still is not enough to destroy anything unless we hit you or you but that's ideally these would be the corpses that we want to take out using our random Loyal ability procs here. I, I, we might run out of run out of Arbalist here, but I do think we kind of need to hit one of these guys to keep the chain going. Once one of them does actually get taken out, 
problem with that. One, two, three, four, five. This would be six. Is now we need... Yeah. So now we need to hit you with this one and hit the Jason one, their next Arbalist. And we are relying entirely on this leader ability charge right here, I think, because we're not going to get another one in time to take out both. But this one's automatic, but also take out you two. And that's... With this many corpses in the range row, that is no guarantee... First, we should play this Arbalist. And we have one more proc. But it's it's not guaranteed by any means that these guys get hit, and we do need them to get hit. So, fingers crossed here. Oh, we got one. Okay. That's huge. We might be fine. That might have saved us. We need all these ones in the range row to go down, though. Okay. I think... We're in the clear here. We might have dodged a bullet, but now we play you, and we destroy... Uh, I mean, technically, we could just... Um, does it matter which one we destroy? I think any of these ones would be sufficient, if I'm not mistaken. I would be really mad at myself if we totally messed that one up, but... Oh, is, is that enough, though? Is that enough, though? It is. Oh! <laughs> okay, we got that one awfully close making me a little nervous there but we did make it work on and that was that counted as our first try right oh and we acquired a card this card has been added to your army and can be found in the command tent skull okay um maybe we don't ask too many questions let's grab these resources and let's maybe we'll take a look at the card then we'll see what the deal is with this point of interest right here what was i assume it's a trinket I assume it's not a unit, but I mean, could it be something that will help us out in that Nilfgaard encounter? Maybe. What does it do? Skull? Banish an any number of units from your graveyard, then damage all units on a row by the amount banished. Whoa. Whoa. There's some serious potential there. It does... does depend a bit on the encounter, and there's one specific... It does depend a bit on your deck as well. There's one specific setup that immediately comes to mind uh, that I don't think we could pull off right now, because at least it would require that we create a bunch of additional cards to do it. So, the Rivian Pikeman, I I bashed this card a little bit, I think, very early on, because at least in multiplayer, you are limited to having two of the same type of card in your deck simultaneously. So I thought, I mean, summoning playing one of these Rivian Pikemen and summoning just one more from your deck... For a total of six points and a tiny bit of deck thinning, not that inspiring. However, in Thronebreaker, you can exceed two of the same type of card in your deck as long as you're talking about a, a non-gold unit like this. So we could theoretically have a deck full of 20 Rivian Pikemen. I mean, it's not a row room for 20 Rivian Pikemen, but nine Rivian Pikemen. Play one in one row, and that will immediately fill up the rest of the row with all the remaining Rivian Pikemen. They're weak. If they get destroyed by your opponent, then you have a bunch of cards that get into your graveyard very quickly. You banish all nine of those, plus whatever else your opponent happens to have destroyed. And at that point, that makes the skull deal nine or more damage to your opponent's, or all of your opponent's cards in a row. That's that's pretty significant. Now, that's, of course, a, a niche scenario, a somewhat niche scenario in which you somehow get precisely one Rivian Pikeman in your hand, all the remaining ones in your deck, you play the Rivian Pikeman in an empty row, and your opponent has enough damage to somehow remove all of them quickly, but it's not impossible. That's that's the extreme case, but a less extreme case might still be a way to potentially set up the Skull. There are some anti-synergies, however, that come to mind as well. Playing, no, it's not you, it's the Field Medic, right? that played cards from our graveyard, wherever it went. We not have the ability to craft it. We had one at one point, but we may not have actually gained the ability to make one in, unless we spend some resources to unlock that ability. But it was, yeah, a card that I believe might have played a random card from our deck, or a random unit, maybe. And so obviously if you banish every unit in your deck, then you're not going to play one of those from your deck, so that would be an anti-synergy with the skull, but we're obviously not doing that at the moment, so that... Is not a downside 
for us at least, not in the short term. So this could potentially be an answer for that Nilfgaardian point of interest that we had against Rigith we were trying previously. That's one card that might be relevant. I was also thinking Marjoram Bear does not deal damage, and that is very much what we want to do, is just maximize all of our damage. So something like Becker's Dark Mirror. I think we had another damage a unit by one eight times. Basically loading up our deck with additional trinkets that pack guaranteed damage is I'm thinking what might end up being our answer if we do end up heading back soon to that Vrigith encounter. We currently, of course, only have two keepsakes that we can keep in our deck. However, we may be looking to make that upgrade soon because we bump that up to three. That only costs 1,500 and 500 gold and wood, respectively. So it is within our price range. But we might be getting a little ahead of ourselves here. That's just what I have in the back of my mind as a potential solution if we do find ourselves trying on that Frigate encounter again soon. But there's also this question mark here, this point of interest. So what is the deal with this? Oh, no. I see the morale. I guess, wait, actually, we're already on low morale. Hold on. Our morale can't go lower, can it? Let's see. What is the deal? Report. My queen. The Adernians retreated with haste abandoning their tents, supplies, and even some of their equipment. We found something in the commander's quarters. I've no doubt you'll know what to do with it, my lady. Have the soldiers draw lots to determine who shall open the chest, in which case... Oh, we actually lose a recruit. That's a little bit odd. We lose morale, but we do gain a card fragment. That is plus side of that. Have Isabel cleanse the chest of spells and curses before opening it. Okay, I was wondering, like, I get the morale going down from stealing something from the Adernians. I did not understand why this would cost us a recruit, but I think the implication, reading between the lines based on what we see here, is that there's some kind of curse on the chest, and so without Isbel cleansing the chest of those curses, we're going to lose someone or we can leave it all together. But, I mean, this is maybe not exactly what Isbel signed up for, but if she can do this... And that's pretty sweet, because we would very much like to get this card fragment. So I think we give it a shot. Oh, and we completed it as well. It's Artifact Impression. This card now complete. You can find it in the command tent. So, all right. That adds one more card that we might want to take a look at here. Let's check it out. Would it also be something worth using against Frigith? We're about to see. Artifact Impression. Restraint. Okay, so it can't target any of the bosses. That includes Frigith. But maybe targeting some of his friends might be relevant. Transform an enemy into a jade figurine and move it to your hand. What? Can we see what a jade figurine is? Not here. No preview. The figurine expanded in a flash, pulsing and throbbing, changing its shape and structure like a puff of smoke crawling over the floor. Beams of light revealed movement and hardening materials. A moment later... In the centrum of the magic circle, a human form suddenly appeared. Okay. Hmm. So. In that case. That one may be a little bit of a harder sell, at least for this upcoming encounter with Frigith. Whereas Becker's Dark Mirror can directly target bosses, so that's good. And as can Dosbog Runestone. So those, I think, are the more obvious inclusions. And as I was saying, if we want to add... Both of them, we'd swap out Marjoram and Bear and probably need to make that purchase to increase our maximum trinket count by one. Skull also. Artifact Compression. These two would perhaps be the fourth trinkets that we might consider, although if we are to go that high up on the trinket count, then it starts to get pretty pricey and we would not be able to afford that, especially once you consider that we need to buy the this one first and then still somehow come up with 3,000 gold, so... That's pretty unlikely, but I think adding one more to our cap might be in the cards for us in the near future. But either way, I think this is a good place for us to wrap up here. So thank you all for watching. Hope you enjoyed the video, and I'll catch you next time.